ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಶ್ಯಾಮ ಅಂತರು ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸೊ ಐ ಥಾಟ್ ವಿ ಕುಡ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ ಆನ್ ಅ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ವಿಚ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಮೆನ್ಷನ್ ಟುಡೆ ಫೋಮೋ ದ ಫಿಯರ್ ಆಫ್ ಮಿಸ್ಸಿಂಗ್ ಔಟ್ ಮೇಬಿ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಲೀಡ್ ದ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಟುಡೆ ಅಂಡ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಟ್ರೈ ಟು ಫಾಲೋ ಆಲ್ ರೈಟ್ uh i'll be very candid with our viewers our audience that uh, this comes in the category of some kind of fashionable stylish acronyms which uh, kind of come in vogue and then uh, some people say it exists some people say it doesn't in one of my trying to get some notes i stumbled across a guardian uk page which had fomo on it and i was surprised that almost uh, 60 70 people responded uh, guardian uk has sometimes 1000 plus comments or 5000 comments on certain political things like brexit or uh, england's performance at the european championship or boris johnson's policies or whatever or india's covid response sometimes it's very a heated discussion FOMO seems to be not so much of a problem and uh, with typical British flair and British sarcasm, some are saying, just move out of social media. Somebody is saying, I have a, I have a wood, wood-fired iPod and I have uh, a desktop which runs on Steam. So this is the <laughs> this is the sarcasm intended that if you feel that uh, this is uh, not your cup of tea or this is there is too much heat in the kitchen move out so i'll just make a brief uh, kind of a foundational uh, premise it so just quickly uh, yeah now before we start the discussion i checked out on my dictionaries i have an offline dictionary where fomo is not there okay but i look at it gave some some other supplementary features are acronyms idioms and encyclopedia so in all of them it is there yes and the the broad meaning is that the worry that one may miss an enjoyable activity <clears throat> especially due to the fact <clears throat> that one often sees others documenting such activities on social media okay That's interesting <clears throat> that means the more we see others doing this activity the more we will miss them if you don't see them then we won't miss them at all that's an interesting way of looking at it okay my notes say that uh, this is the fear of this is the feeling or participant or perception i'm sorry that others are having more fun facebook and instagram are the favorite whipping boys so to say that they exacerbate the problem they increase the problem and uh, this is one thing which we may touch upon touch upon that social media is meant for connectivity it is meant for making friends meant for greater degree greater uh, latitude for communication but then it actually increases uh, these negative things so mm. it is not just the sense that there might be better things you could be doing at the moment it is a feeling that you are missing out on something fundamentally important that others are experiencing right now so it could be the bogeyman it could be a imagination but then it is there so uh 2007 or 8 it was coined or something like that so now it is 13 14 years so for more could be something today uh on the vein or whatever but how do we i'll i'll, I'll begin with this uh, discussion uh, by saying that an average teen or somebody who has just uh, come into the social media world you come that you want to have friends you want to have fun so mm-hmm. how much it could be a shock for someone that rather than getting more friends more connectivity and more communication i end up by being more lonely i end up being more sadder than what i am and add to that this thing of 
I, I think somebody could be having more fun, somebody could be leading better lives than me. So, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's a, it's a classic example, I would say, of a, a artificially created demand ending up with real distress. In a sense that uh, one of the challenges with social media in general is that we often see others at their best or at least others portray their lives at the best. Yes. And as compared to that, you know, we experience our life at in its full breadth. Some of it might be good, some of it can be terrible and most of it is in one sense boring. So, given that situation, it is just natural for people to feel that they are, they are not having all the fun they could be having. And that leads to this problem. And especially with respect to social media, I fear that the problem might be worse than what it needs to be. But because there is a time when people are especially insecure mm. and vulnerable. I would say it's in the teenage years when one is tr struggling out trying to form one's identity. At that time, what the world thinks about us is so important. So now this is specifically FOMO is, we could say, where we see others doing enjoyable things. We feel that I should also be doing those things and why am I not doing those things? So... So we could analyze this in, first of all, that, that conception of enjoyment is created, propagated, and then the absence of that enjoyment is felt all the more. Mm, what is that uh, Bhagavatam verse that Kurvan Dukkha Pratikaram Sukhvan Manyate Gruhi. So it's like we create a distress for ourselves by exposing ourselves to some things. And then we, if we get relief from that distress, oh, I didn't miss out on this. I was a part of this. It's, that, those are my thoughts. All right. <clears throat> so, generally, the temptation today is to see if something is related to Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Clubhouse, or that kind of social media usage. Then... One easy solution is just to just don't do that. Hmm. Just don't go there. And uh, this kind of rings a bell where drug addiction was approached during the Ronald Reagan era by his wife, Nancy Reagan. Just say no. And this was a American government, a US federal uh, budget supported initiative just say no and stickers and badges and slogans and uh, flags and festoons made and then they realize that just by saying no there is no actual uh, it doesn't happen like that in real life by just saying no we who study Bhagavad Gita we understand that if the gross senses are saying no, but if the mind is dwelling on those things, then there is no mm. actual question of negation. And therefore, unless there is uh, some kind of understanding that envy of others, jealousy of others, trying to really understand whether somebody is actually happy or their Instagram posts and Facebook posts are showing them happy. Mm. So I'll, I'll, I'll relate a funny thing that uh, one person told me that. Let's say husband, wife and two daughters. So planning a vacation itself was a stressful thing. Now they stay in a European country. So what could be a what could be a good uh, choice for vacation. So that took a few days. And then 
flight cancellation and so many other things and flight landing a bit late the hotel room not exactly to their liking what was shown in the brochure didn't turn out like that and then at the beach uh it was not that glamorous as they see in some promo videos and again some other issues uh family not agreeing on what to do at a particular time and somehow after three days they come back and uh, a friend says that actually actually i was relieved that i came back <laughs> so rather than you getting feelings oh, that uh, the vacation was very nice or refreshing or something you just feel relieved that at least it's over now when they decide to put all their pictures on social media and then they get reaction from friends like wow you really seem to be enjoying how nice to see all four of you together you know in our family doesn't happen like that or here doesn't happen like that and actually he said when we saw the pictures and we saw the reactions we actually said we must have have had a, we must we must have had a good time because oh, how come all these people are uh, you know unanimous in saying that we really enjoyed so this is a strange thing happening of course this is not exactly related to fomo fomo is where the other persons must be experiencing well this fellow managed to get this extra day connected to the weekend and uh, how nice of them and how so the reality is completely different the family who went there they could rate on a scale of 0 to 10 something like 4.5 or 4.7 but public reaction makes it 8.7 or 9.5 or something and then they start thinking oh it must we must have have been happy so in today's culture even when you are enjoying something you are not there you need to be reminded later what is the evidence that you were happy this particular photo shows you are you look very happy here and then the person said oh yeah actually actually i was happy yeah 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 so why should i be sad today i should be happy oh yes 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 so uh, i think two days ago you were discussing something about uh, somebody calling this the attention economy you remember yes. so some people call it the clickbait economy or the attention economy when everything is dependent upon my social media appearance somebody else's social media appearance it is hardly uh, difficult to understand that uh, there will be something of a phenomenon where uh, there is a sale for apparel clothing there is a sale for jewelry there is a sale for electronic gadgets what you are saying if i understand right now is that it is a acute problem faced by a particular demographic which is excessive which itself is excessively hooked to the social media and which is also uh, targeted by the corporate world today mm. so where the economy is measured in terms of attention attention and how attention can be retained so that's what both the psychology of the people and uh, we could say the psychology of the marketers both combined to create this problem yes this uh, fear of missing out is somewhat uh, discounted by maybe the elderly demographic 40 45 plus saying that well if i don't want uh, social media i just uh, log out i just switch off what's the big deal about that true i suspect here that it's not like just because you are above 40 you already have some self control but just to be a bit objective this is something which i found that uh, what are the habits of like how much have marketers uh, been successful in uh, giving these kind of habits to people today 
So let me just come to this note of mine as to, okay, it is something interesting. Now, this is just one country and that too about five, six years ago, this big uh, survey was done. I think it may resonate with most of the other countries. And I'm not talking about just first world or second world or third world like that. <clears throat> 98%, the, it begins with 35% of Facebook users are below the age of 25, which is a big chunk. 98% of them use their application on smartphones only. So sometimes the oldie like me, I could be seeing my Facebook page on a desktop, but... <laughs> In today's times, 98% of this younger crowd check social media on their smartphones alone. 90% check their phone when they wake up. It means okay. the first thing you do as soon as you are awake in the so-called real world, mm. you, are, you are online. 87% on public transport. So even if you feel like you are going somewhere, like previously the self-help motivation speakers would say that, use your commuting time for development. Read a good book. Oh, you can't read. So at least take your audio book with you. Or if somebody has done some research or homework, then you or a businessman may uh, just make a mental note of something speak it in his private sound recorder and uh, hear it himself while in commute. So commuting time was seen as a uh, time which is available and which should not be misutilized. But now that also has been taken over by social media. 84% while watching TV. Oh. That means so, even they, they're not so you're not even yourself. properly entertaining yourself, you're not properly enlightening yourself, you're simply being crushed. As in India, we have this you've seen this sugarcane press, which old style rural India they just hand cranked uh, sugarcane press mm. where you just put one sugarcane stock from one end and comes out the other, and the juice is being extracted. So social media seems to be doing something like that to the to the mind. Uh, oh. What else? So, so one person is saying that this is a great uncontrolled experiment on kids. <laughs> it's a it's a great uncontrolled experiment on kids. So, oh God, so yeah. what does what does FOMO can do in terms of? Tangible damage, decrease in personal privacy, increased detachment from friends and family, increased feelings of loneliness, which is now a Ep uh, it's epidemic almost accepted disease. At least UK and Japan have a ministry for combating loneliness, mm. dissatisfaction with one's life. So all are these all are the fundamental drivers of uh, the negative consequences of FOMO. And these in turn are related to and significantly aggravate. Like this is something where I feel lonely, I am detached, I am dissatisfied. So the negativity is, uh, is restricted to my own body and mind. But then it aggravates increased unfair judgment of others whether it is on the basis of race, community, skin color, political views. And that's why we see this rash of so-called TV shows, uh, which proclaim to be having some discussion, but it's mostly below the belt hitting. What do you mean by below the belt in this Below country? the belt, hitting below the belt. That means it's not exactly for a dialogue or understanding the ramifications of a particular political decision. It is just uh, like what we call in Sanskrit, vitanda, just arguing okay. for the sake of arguing. Okay. 
and uh, then change in personality paranoia jealousy and finally which could be very consequential for our students or those who are studying a significant decrease in concentration levels so we may see in fomo is just like oh this person is just feeling that i am just left out but these are the things so i i'm sure we are not going to take all these uh, uh, negative things and uh, uh, addressing them in our talk today so would you, where would you like to proceed now mm, now maybe i'll just start with a slightly contrarian perspective okay that uh, see just because somebody is is constantly on their devices doesn't necessarily mean that they are controlled by their devices or they are addicted because I, my understanding is it also depends on one's own uh, self centered not not self centered in the how much one is centered on oneself or grounded in oneself so could you, could you elaborate that on a little bit yeah that means say let's take somebody uh, picking up a uh, the phone first thing in the morning now i'm not sure always that's a bad thing somebody may pick up a phone to read a bhagavad gita verse some people you know many authors they feel that their creativity is maximum in the subliminal zone between the uh, between full wakefulness and complete sleep that means as soon as you wake up you just want to concentrate on something speak which some, yeah okay. speak something out and maybe record that so i know some authors i at least i read this in writing book is that first thing you do when you wake up if you feel your writing is not moving forward just keep your laptop next to you and write down for 15 minutes whatever comes in your brain so at least on your day you will feel that you did something in your writing direction so so just the external activity of picking up a phone as the first thing in the morning that may not necessarily mean a bad thing now of course i agree that say the number of people doing this maybe only 10% or 5% and the others might be compulsively controlled by the devices and that will be 90% also but to some extent i find it helpful to consider that sattva rajas and tamas the sattva doesn't just like it's not that just by living in a village somebody will be in sattva somebody okay. can, uh, can be disconnected from technology and still be in tamas Hmm? they may be alcoholics or they may just wasting their lives doing various things doing nothing practically and somebody can be in satyam sattva it's difficult but i feel that sometimes just as uh, at a physical level we might uh, uh, we might presume that a person living in a city is in passion or ignorance and a person living in a village is in goodness similarly my understanding would be that it's not so much how much somebody is uh, is using technology or but or but what are they doing with the technology so and that and that's where i think your earlier point about that uncontrolled experiment on kids see the a person at the age of 35 40 even 50 even if they are they are hooked on to devices it's unlikely that they will get into something like video gaming addiction they already gone through their lives and they will use it and they may use it well also of course anybody can get addicted but i feel that in that time when the hormones are rising when already one's sense of self worth is one is actually searching for a sense of self identity that those teenage years that is the time when the effect of the social media and effect of device usage can be quite damaging so that was one one thing i wanted to just qualify that rather than just focusing on the frequency of the usage it is the nature of the usage we could also consider mm -hmm. and the other point i felt is that uh, you want to comment on this mm. can i give you a contrarian view to the contrarian view yeah please <laughs> <laughs> uh i also heard i'm also a student of this understanding that uh, creative writing one of my favorite kind of uh, hobbies and you just write free write we have authors like uh, netly goldberg who teaches in her books then julia cameron about the first three pages morning three pages hmm so one person said 
I forget who the author is. Like just because somebody is scratching his head doesn't mean he's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, beautiful. <laughs> But normally people who think do scratch their heads occasionally. It may not be a universal trait. Or somebody is pensive and he has his like this. So oh, he's thinking. Like that uh, sculpture, famous sculpture of Henri Rodin, the person, the thinker, very famous uh, one. So there has to be some training in thinking. Then you may scratch your head, you may not scratch your head, but some thinking may go on. So similarly, I'm beautifully put. So here I am seeing that uh, as early as 2013, psychologists are trying to understand how to define FOMO. so it's like a pervasive apprehension you have this negative feeling that others are having very rewarding experiences in life the first part is others could be everybody else or at least those that group of which i am a part of or whom i am seeing around me they are having a very rewarding life and i don't and uh, other part is the desire to stay continually connected to what others are doing so if if a majority of your friends are on vacation and you are not and you have a very good reason you have an important examination coming on you have a job interview you have something else in life to look after or you have decided to give importance to a spiritual uh, part of your life but then people are saying oh no we are going for this vacation or this celebration or whatever so that time fomo can be a very uh, debilitating experience for the mind so every person even from the material point of view they have given up on something in order to achieve something like yeah. thomas alva edison this famous quote that his assistant moan that 10000 substances and we are still not able to find out which combination works for this incandescent uh, bulb so he says no 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 we are not we are not having 10000 failures we know 10000 combinations don't work something like that so how are you connecting that with fomo so that so so that is at the price of giving up so many other social engagements is it not okay so like tolstoy writing 15 times or something he ended the ending of war and peace and he said like every time it was a painful experience that whether this one fits no 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 there is something else there is something else there is something else so obviously good creative things they come at a price but today what is happening with the generation we have uh this study also found that fomo is particularly prevalent among young males and uh, these people are scoring low on satisfaction of basic psychological needs like autonomy competence relatedness to other people or other things in life so when you have lower levels of life satisfaction low positivity and uh, <laughs> very interesting so these high fomo young male group these are more likely to use social media immediately before sleep immediately upon waking during both meals and even during university lectures okay you know at so, one time i was looking at uh, how does one define addiction so now for example some people say that i got a food addiction so psychologists debate whether you can actually call food an addiction okay. because say unlike alcohol alcohol you don't have to drink it at all drugs you don't have to take them at all so food is something which you have to take so with some can something which is a necessity become an addiction or is it only something which is a uh, which is a which is a non necessity that can be called as addiction so some people who are addiction experts they are a little uh, what do you say concerned about the indiscriminate use of the word addiction because they feel that that will uh, devalue the gravity of the problem of addiction where it is really present hmm? but why i was telling this is that um, actually 
even with respect to the problem of uh, net usage or anything they talk about three things that uh, there is a constant craving to do something and then there is a lack of control in not doing it and then there is the thing called three c's craving uh, control uh, absence of control controllessness you could say and then third is uh, unmindfulness of consequences mm. even if one knows this is leading me to problems still one just can't stop it so if we take that typography i think it's a reasonable inference to say that uh, there are a lot of people who can have problems with excessive usage yeah so so your uh, can we move to the yeah, uh, part of finding solutions or we have uh, yeah so some... just to clarify your contrary to co- contrarian to contrarian point was that that actually even when somebody says i am going to use it in a regulated way uh, are uh, is that person trained with the resources to use it in a regulated way mm. otherwise yeah i think that's also the problem with that philosophy which say dr- drink but don't get drunk <laughs> is something like that <laughs> oh yeah i mean many people say that because in the western culture drinking is quite common it's just a part of the mainstream culture and even there also they know that alcoholism is a issue so they say that i think it is uh, is it jehovah's witness or one of the christian churches they say yeah drink but don't get drunk so oh, the, prob- the problem is that mm-hmm. it, once one gets habituated to it it may go out of control mm. so yes yeah, so with respect to solutions i think you hinted at that that one needs at level one some some training just you know is the scr- scratching of not not scratching the head alone but knowing how to think is required so what are your thoughts about solutions i have come across uh, maybe a uh, cross section of psychological help sites so they come with the classic uh, what is that alcoholic anonymous is uh, 12 steps yeah first is admit that you have a problem okay so you feel like you are missing out you feel others are having more fun you feel others are having a rich and rewarding experience now the the truth may be very well something very different somebody missing out on a picnic because of an exam or whatever could be studying and thinking about the friends having a nice time at the beach or at a walking trail or whatever and those at the beach could be very well miserable because you know that famous uh, story once radhanath maharaj told about some eels or some kind of a fish which gives this sort of a small electric current and uh, so the whole group of devotees had planned to take a nice summer plunge in the sea have some nice have a nice tea bath and then come and have nice lunch and then they were told that oh no this part of the sea because it is vacant because of the danger of this kind of eel swimming here and then they went to a nice spot where they could have their lunch uh, there was a swarm of bees so they could not be there so i'm not saying that this will happen universally to everybody but chances are that those very friends who according to you are having a rich and rewarding experience and you are feeling miserable some of them could be thinking that look at this person he is he did such a he took such a nice decision i mean um, he was very right in not coming here we came here but we are so miserable so a is thinking that b and c and d are happy while b and c and d are thinking that a is actually happy so uh, you may actually have to uh, ponder if you really have a problem and the first step is accepting that you have a problem and uh, what is the way out just uh, a small dialogue with yourself 
I cannot be everywhere at all times. I cannot be always be doing the coolest thing ever. I cannot be enjoying to the max all the time. And uh, psychologists are saying that just admitting and accepting that you have anxiety. It's like uh, you are releasing your secret to the universe and the burden is off your shoulders. There is insecurity, mm. you are acknowledging that. But now at least you can recognize the pattern and deal with it. So the first step is to acknowledge that there is a situation where I am getting those kind of feelings. Any thoughts on that? That's beautiful. So that means even the admission at one level, admitting the problem is essential, but just indiscriminately publicizing the problem is not necessarily healthy. There has to be some level of, uh, sometimes speaking about a problem helps us to find solutions. And sometimes speaking about a problem can also make us, what is the word? Uh, identify oneself as a, what is it? There's an adjective, like a problem person. Like if somebody has uh, victimized us, then yes. it's important that we don't start thinking of ourselves as a victim. You know, one of the things which I read is that uh, technology can, can enormously empower those who have a purpose and technology can endlessly confuse those who don't have a purpose. <laughs> So in one sense, I thought of correctly, this is 2.41 in the Gita. Like, Bahushakha yanantascha buddhayo vyavasainam. So technology can actually increase the Bahushakha. Ananta Shakha, literally it makes it endless. Yes. And FOMO is a, in one sense, and I thought of, when I thought of FOMO for the first time, it's like, uh, in in something like in fearing the paths you have not taken, in fear, in not in being afraid that you are you are missing out on the roads that you are not traveling on, you end up actually not traveling on the roads you are traveling on. Mm. I didn't get to see that place. I didn't get to see that place, but you don't see the scenery on the place that you are on. So, can I give a graphic example for this? Yeah, please. It's one of my favorites. You get six invitations for a party. One has, say, Chinese food, Mexican, Thai, Marwadi, Gujarati, South Indian, Bombay chart. And you can go to only one. So there is certainly, and you may be a foodie, you may like all of them. So while enjoying your particular choice, you also have a choice of being miserable because you are missing out on those other items which you cannot get there. So either you can enjoy what you have in your plate and the kind of ambience association in that particular place, or by going there, having that plate and still be miserable because you're not able to, or you can be worrying about what if I had gone there, I would actually enjoy it a little bit more. So as you said, you are on a journey, but rather than seeing outside the window and enjoying the scenery. You are inward looking, but inward looking not like an introspective stage, but a person experiencing FOMO. And then you switch on the projector screen in your mental theater and all the mind will be telling, all that the mind will tell you is, you are losing out big time. Everybody else is having a much rewarding experience. And look at you. Is that what you're hinting? Yes, definitely. I mean, that example of a eatable, a desert is very beautiful, very practical also. So, so that means that brings us to another point. We could say awareness of the problem, then creating a sense of purpose. Then another thing we could say is that um, appreciating what we have, appreciating the value of what we have. And you know, Prabhupada talks about this in the purport of the 1716, austerity of the mind. Manaha prasad saumyatvam, maunam atma vinigraha. 
So Manaha Prasad, he says, is that the more we contemplate on the sense objects, the more dissatisfied we become. So, so therefore, he says, instead of contemplating the sense objects, focus on connecting with, uh, focus on Krishna, or focus on the scripture stories in the scripture, satisfying stories in the scriptures, and that's how you can become, you can uh, feel contented, you can feel satisfied. So, so, so I'll just finish up my notes about the uh, how to combat FOMO. So one is the first thing is that you accept. And two things. One is the second part consists of, as you rightly said, uh, becoming, finding a purpose. And that may come in the category of being mindful of uh, how you do even some mundane daily tasks. Another mm -hmm. thing strongly recommended is a person who is always feeling that the universe is not giving me what I deserve, I am missing out, I am missing out, it is kind to everybody else except me, you are basically like a automatic process becoming very self-centered. And one of the strongest antidotes to that is being grateful for what you have. Mm. It is said that all those who cultivate gratitude, they feel like giving more to others because you already feel, I'm already having much more and I can always share whether it is attention, love, affection, resources, whatever. The converse is true for somebody who's feeling that the universe is not looking after me properly. So even when resources come by that person's way, they're always seen as deficient. And that deficiency makes him even more needy. And the opposite is true for a grateful person. Even if something little comes, that person is saying, oh, I'm getting more than what I deserve. So not only his, his positive mindset makes him uh, kind of resilient to absorb further or any other shocks. And this kind of no gratitude mentality makes a person more vulnerable for other uh, toxic mental attacks, whether it is of jealousy, envy, or feeling low, or outright right up to, you can say, depression, dementia. Well, dementia could be an aging problem, but at least depression, which could be uh, something which you can control, albeit to some extent. True. So... <clears throat> Uh -huh. yeah, I was thinking of another verse from the Gita that Aneka Chitta Vibhranta Moha Jala Samavritaha. Krishna is describing the Asuri mentality? Or? Asuri Pratiya, yes. Okay. 16, 16, 17. <coughs> the consciousness is played in various directions. Aneka Chitta Vibhranta and in Moha Jala Samavritaha. So there also what Krishna says is ultimate solution is Tasmat Shastram Pramanamte. Take some guidelines for living from scripture. So in some ways, I find that uh, that starting with things which are doable, because sometimes this one is habituated to something, it's like, or fixated on something, trying to battle that can seem like a huge boulder to lift. So sometimes one of the biggest problems with, uh, with any kind of compulsive behavior is not just that one can't control that behavior, one actually loses one's confidence in oneself that I can control anything at all. Mm -hmm. So starting with something which may seem unrelated, but is important. Say like, say like taking meals at a fixed time or having a broad, broad pattern for waking up, sleeping, creating some kind of structure in one's life gives one some semblance of order. So one of the things which uh, I have found helpful and when I'm talking with uh, people is that now, instead of telling people come to sattva because it's not so easy for everybody to live sattvically but it's like create pockets of sattva in your day try to have some measure of sattva so for example in our, in our practices we have the morning program which is meant to be somewhat sattvic so if we create some kind of regulation that can be a beginning <laughs> And then gradually, as one starts, okay, this I can do. 
one gets one self confidence and once the self confidence increases then we can move forward towards mm, toward uh, toward tackling the bigger problems which might seem so one extreme is to think that this is no problem and i don't have to bother about it at all mm. and the other is that this is such a big problem i can't do anything about it so why bother about it i just let live with it mm. so would like to summarize yeah sure. i just yeah. uh, Thank you all my points so i thought that uh, we discuss so in discussing about fomo today we focused on uh, broadly three aspects first is that how it's a serious problem for a, especially young people where the problem is created by on one side their own psychological vulnerabilities because of their age as well as their uh, that uh, the teenage phase of their life uh as well as the the environment where the media is targeting and providing so many options uh for so many promises of enjoyment and it's based on an illusion that what i don't have or what others have is far more enjoyable than what i have when actually what they have is also not all that enjoyable it's just a illusion that is created so then we talk of course the contrarian and contrarian to contrarian view that, that just because somebody is using a device a lot doesn't mean that they are use they are using it destructively but it also doesn't mean that they are always using it constructively so what is required is the some amount of training like just scratch if a person is thinking they may scratch their head but just a person who is scratching their head doesn't mean that they are thinking <laughs> beautiful and then we talked about how a problem we can identify it is becoming serious when when there's a constant craving there's lack of control and there is uh, one doesn't stop even after getting consequences and then talk about solutions first is to acknowledge the problem in yeah. a in a relatively safe environment so that one becomes aware and gets some guidance encouragement to deal with it and second would be having a sense of purpose then that will use us you know what what we are to do then we can say no to other things and appreciating the value of what we are doing and what we have that also helps a lot and then creating starting with self control wherever we can begin and then gradually expanding it to other domains and i think one point which you might want to elaborate toward the end is how bhakti spirituality itself can help because in one sense all these are we could say universal spiritual or sattvic solutions bhakti spirituality can also give us uh, say access to the the power of the supreme inside us and in that sense it can be a game changer if we can access the divine through the practice of bhakti anything you want to add on that point just the last point of feeling grateful the more yeah, you are so actually appreciation and gratitude i was saying the same thing okay but yeah okay. but i'm feeling grateful feeling appreciating and being grateful for what we have so that's the example of i have a relishable eatable but i'm simply looking at what others have and feeling dissatisfied yes so thank you prabhu thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna